lots of items onto planes uh, because they're non-metallic. Bill, Republican in Fairfield, Connecticut, our last call. Go ahead. <clears throat> yes, uh, I hate to keep hammering you with this underwear thing, but yes, there's been a lot of news about this. In fact, it was televised on C-SPAN before Congress. Expeditious coordination with our national security partners is not to be underestimated. There have been numerous cases where our unilateral and uncoordinated revocation of the visa would have disrupted important investigations that were underway by one of our national security partners. They had the individual under investigation, and our revocation action would have disclosed U.S. government's interest in that individual and ended our colleagues' ability, such as the FBI, to pursue the case quietly and to identify terrorist plans and co-conspirators. Under Secretary of State for Management, Patrick Kennedy said that um, the gentleman was allowed to get on the airplane uh, because they were tracking him, which is troubling in either case, knowing that he had a bomb on him and, and allowing him to get on the plane in the first place. Uh, again, I'm, un I'm unaware of that. All right, Mickey. Sure, I can't say it's false. Um, my understanding is that he was targeted for questioning by U.S. Customs and Border Protection, mm. which was operating passenger screening for overseas passengers like uh, Abdul Matalab, and uh, that they had planned to question him when he arrived in Detroit. Now, obviously, if he was successful, you know, they wouldn't have been able to question him because he would have blown himself and 360 other people up. <laughs> Airplane. Uh, because they were tracking him, which is troubling in either case, knowing that he had a bomb on him. Uh, again, I'm, un I'm unaware of that. All right, Mickey. And uh, that they had planned to question him when he arrived in Detroit. Now, obviously, if he was successful, you know, they wouldn't have been able to question him because he would have blown himself and 360 other people up. <laughs> Robert, independent caller in Austin, Texas. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> it's amazing how much... Uh, different information on this, this underwear bomber there is. This guy never had a visa. The gentleman was let on the plane, literally forced. They, they tried to keep him off the plane, and two attorneys who have just submitted, you can go look on YouTube, said that <clears throat> he was let on the plane forcibly. He was denied access to that airplane two or three times in some unnamed office in, this, in the U.S. government. And you should look this up. How to kill in the name of God. The only thing that prevented the defendant from being successful that day was his own bad luck. The only thing that prevented the defendant from being successful that day was his own bad luck. Abu Matalab's goal, maximum destruction. He sat in seat 19A near the left wing, close to an 11,000-gallon fuel tank. The only reason he did not kill everyone on board is because the bomb's detonator malfunctioned. Prosecutors bluntly say Abu Matalab is an unrepentant mass murderer. Who would try to kill again if given sir they they let him on that plane forcibly he was not allowed to be on that plane and somebody put him on that plane now why would a cia agent the, the unnamed agency want to get that guy on the plane i'm not familiar with the story of uh, anybody attempting to stop him um my understanding is that the uh walk us through what you saw in amsterdam uh, uh, sure uh laurie and i were sitting near the uh boarding gate sitting on the floor there weren't any seats to sit in and uh, I saw two men and they caught my eye because they seemed to be an odd pair one was uh, what I would describe as a poor looking black teenager around 16 or 17 and the other the other man a, a age 50 ish uh, wealthy looking Indian man and I was just wondering why they were together kind of strange and I watched them approach what I would call the the ticket agent the final person that checks your boarding pass before you get on the plane and I could hear the entire conversation the only person that spoke was the Indian man and what he said was uh, this man needs to board the plane but he doesn't have a passport and the ticket agent responded well if he doesn't have a passport you can't get on the plane to which the Indian man responded back uh, he's from Sudan we do this all the time and the ticket agent said well then you'll have to go and talk to my manager and she the only thing that prevented the defendant from being successful that day was his own bad luck Mutalib didn't have a passport and wasn't going to be allowed onto that plane except he was escorted by two men two men in suits 
who claimed national security in order to get him onto the plane. And uh, Kurt Haskell, in his, in his testimony, said all this. He wasn't allowed to actually be a witness to the trial because they got him to plead guilty. But I just feel that the real terrorist that we should be afraid of is our federal government, and the TSA sticking their hands down our pants isn't going to make things better. It might I don't appreciate that last uh, comment, but Devin's bringing up this question that one of our earlier callers mentioned of uh, an idea that, that Mutalib was somehow forced to go on the plane or was escorted by agents of some kind. I am unfamiliar with that um, story. Um, I can't say it's true or I can't say it's false. Um, my understanding is that he was targeted for questioning by U.S. Customs and Border Protection mm which was operating passenger screening for overseas passengers like uh, Abdul Muttalib, and uh, that they had planned to question him when he arrived in Detroit. Now, obviously, if he was successful, you know, they wouldn't have been able to question him because he would have blown himself and 360 other people up. Let's talk about a recent Inspector General report. There okay, let's go to Mark in Wayne, Michigan, on our independent line. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, C-SPAN. Good morning, America. And also, good morning, Mr. Carter. McCarter. Good morning. Uh, yes, I have a question about you claiming that you had no idea about that uh, underwear bomber being helped onto that plane. I live on disability, and I even knew about that. If you've seen the evidence that I have gathered about this individual and about the warehouses that were completely filled with all of these body scanners and no airports were buying them. So then this underwear bomber thing came along and every one of them got sold immediately. This is how they work. These elites that have hijacked the federal government are using it by use, use of the media, by lying to the people. So Mark, so Mark, you're saying that there's an infrastructure in place that's geared towards making money off these crises. So Mark is claiming that it's a, a generated crisis in order to, to help businesses uh, uh, make money. Well, I have to say, you know, after after this program, I'm kind of interested in talking to my colleague, Tony Kimmery, who specializes in intelligence to see if he is aware of, you know, uh, the stories that somebody might have helped the underwear bomber onto this plane, uh, because I, I certainly am unaware of them. Um, as for the, uh, there's lots of accusations of, uh, you know, government being in bed with industry on various issues. Um, I, t I know as a matter of policy that the Bush administration had actually had a plan for the whole body imagers to be rolled out and um, that that was under consideration by the Obama administration before the underwear bombing incident and then that's just sort of accelerated that plan and put it into public view um, whereas this was always sort of on the paper um, because there is a realization that metal detectors can only detect metal and we've had these problems before where people bring ill 